Revelation chapter 2. We're going to be examining the letters to the seven churches. And as I mentioned, there's good cause to inquire right up front. Why were some mentioned? Why were the others? Well, we're going to answer that mystery, I believe. They, the, Revelation chapter 2 and 3 they, differs from other chapters in, in the prophecy. Of course, in them the Lord has dictates seven letters to seven churches, um, which we believe have been selected to represent the entire Christian church in its seven-fold historical development. These letters, we're going to see condemnation, we're going to see rebukes, <laughs> promises, warnings. You know, in, in a tone of address, it properly introduces a prophecy which is spoken with very specific purpose to reveal the various phases of the church in history. These two chapters, they paint a thorough picture of the church, its blessings, its rebellion, its tribulations, its persecutions, and eventually maturity and triumph. So, though these seven epistles differ in details, they, they follow a remarkable general plan and purpose. They, they really have five common features if you examine them. One, the order to address the set authority, the angels, in each assembly. The authorities are being addressed. Two, a majestic title of Jesus taken from the imagery which appeared in the vision of chapter 1. 3. A revealing of the condition of the church, whether it's good, bad, coupled with admonitions and exhortations. 4. A promise to those who overcome. And 5. A closing, a warning to hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. The first church is Ephesus. This um, time frame, and you're just going to have to bear with me here and watch this develop. We look at it and we look at the years AD 30 to 100, and the word, the implication itself means a relaxation of effort. Let's look at verse 1. Unto the angel the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and your patience, and how you cannot bear them which are evil, and how you have tried them which they, they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars." and has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake you've labored, and you have not fainted." Ephesus was the uh, capital of the Roman province of Asia. Uh, it was really a splendid city if, if you study it and examine it. Now this great center was sought by Paul who labored there three years, and he founded the church. We read that in Acts chapter 18. Afterward, afterwards, he addressed to it the epistle to the Ephesians, which some consider that epistle is probably the best explanation of the new covenant of all the epistles in the New Testament. It was at Ephesus that Timothy received his two epistles from Paul, and early church tradition reveals that John made his home there from really about AD 70 onwards. See, this was the church walking in great truth. Christ commended their labor, what, their patience, their ability to expose false prophets. And 1 John 4 shows us how to test them. Those Ephesians tested them, rejected those who were the liars. Verses 4 and 5. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, 
and do thy first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Christ is merciful to praise before he criticizes. That's what any good leader should do. Always praise first, then criticize second. Truth was not the final destiny of the church. It was just simply the road they were to take to get to their destiny. We can walk in great truth, but it says then we can also lose our first love. We have, we have been warned. This is the church of John's day. It's suffering persecution from the Romans and the Jews. They begin to relax their effort. And there was a terrible reason for this. Now this is very important. We, we've, we've fallen into the same trap with the rise of the futurists and the dispensationalists. The church of the first century incorrectly anticipated that Christ would return after the destruction of Jerusalem. Many believe this. They had, they had misinterpreted what Jesus said to Peter about John. Here's the following discourse from John's Gospel, which explains what the prophetic thinking was. We read this in John chapter 21, verses 20 through 23. Verse 20, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that, that betrayeth thee? Peter seeing, him said, Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus said unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this, this, this is an important verse now, then went this saying abroad amongst the brethren, that the disciples should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him that he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? What business is that of yours? So, so folks, we can see the danger of believing something that might not come to pass if it affected the early church. How much more? Is it going to affect us today? The same scenario plagues 21st century Christianity. All this futurism and dispensationalism giving rise to prophetic lies, misinterpretations. We've taken the future and the destiny and the growth principle, the kingdom away from the church. The church at Ephesus was rebuked for this. Is Christ the same? Yeah, Hebrews 13 and 8 makes that very clear. He has warned of judgment and quick judgment on those who relax their effort. Verses 6 and 7. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of the garden of God. It's interest, interesting when we look at that word Nicolaitans out of the, the Greek derivatives, derivatives of Nikao and Laos or, or overcome the people or the in, inference of want to be rulers instead of servants. There's, there's good studies that can be done on that. Adam Clark uh, summarized the deeds of the Nicolaitans as follows. The followers of Balaam were called Nicolaitans, a sect of Gnostics and Antinomians. All right, just basically simply here, the Gnosticism, uh, matter is all evil, all, all the emancipation just comes through knowledge. That was kind of the Gnostic in a nutshell. Antinomians... They, they rejected concepts of, of social morality. I mean, basically, it's faith only. Nothing else matters. So, no. And they, they, of course, they taught impure doctrines and, and followed the most impure practices. They taught a community of wives that adultery and fornication were things indifferent. 
that eating of meats offered to idols was quite lawful, and they mixed several pagan rites with Christian ceremonies. He that hath an ear, let him hear. The call to solemn attention is found at the close of each epistle. Christian life is a battle, nevertheless, we, we must continue in victory. Let's look at the church of Smyrna now. This is, we date it approximately AD 64 through 313. We're dealing with pagan Rome's persecutions. Verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but you're rich. And I know the blasphemy of, them, blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Hmm. The history of Smyrna's origin, we, we, you know, we really don't know. It's believed that the church was established you know, by one of Paul's evangelists during the second century. It became a very prominent church. Now, Jesus will describe a period of martyrdom. And see, the word Smyrna means anointing oil, symbolic of the Holy Ghost strengthening of these martyrs. These people are destined to suffer terrible persecution, imprisonment, even death. Christ has revealed himself as the one who was dead but now is alive, and if they will call upon if they were called upon to seal their testimony in blood they were to remember that their lord had shared the same fate and that his eyes and anointing would be upon them his grace in other words would be sufficient for their hour and their call and their timing christ's triumph over death he will raise these saints as we're going to understand from the martyr's grave they say there are Jews and not. A lot of various interpretations of this. John denied the right of these Jewish opposers and persecutors to use the term Jews in the sense of God's chosen people. <laughs> Uriah Smith had an uh, interesting comment on this. He said, quote, that the term Jew is not here used in a literal sense is evident. It denotes some character which was approved by the gospel standard. Paul's language will make this point plain when he says in Romans chapter 2, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew in the true sense of the Christian word which is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that of the heart and in the spirit, not of the letter whose praises is not of men but of God. And there's other situations here. There are great studies on the concept of what's being taught here. Pastor Jennings in his version of the book of Revelation. Others. But uh, I, don't, I don't think we need to bog down on that right now because I want to get to the time measure. I believe that's more important. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches, and he that overcome shall not be hurt of the second death. We have a divine time measure. We've already mentioned that in the book of Revelation there are Many of them, and here we have the ten days of the church of Smyrna. Now, we, we try to look at historical events and stuff, and it doesn't make sense in any way you look at this to try to interpret these as ten literal days, as you will see. You shall have tribulation ten days. Remember, this message, folks, is prophetic. We believe of the Astorcia school and have believed for a long, long time that these ten days 
are years. Remember Ezekiel, I have appointed thee each day for a year. Ezekiel 4 and 6. There was, and, there, and there's a reason why we name this period or we date this period of Smyrna or the anointing oil from A.D. 64 to 313. It's because during this time, pagan Rome unleashed ten distinct persecutions against the infant church. This is Satan's attempt to destroy the church with the sword. He fails. Then the papacy comes and he attempts to destroy with manipulation, deception, the sword. He's going to fail again. But in this time period, in these early centuries, there were ten distinct persecutions. Now, the last and the most destructive of the persecutions... Guess what? It lasted 10 years. It's called the Era of the Martyrs or the Great Persecution under Diocletian. He issued a decree for the destruction of all the Christian churches. His slaughter extended from A.D. 303 to A.D. 313. And, and, now, and I'm just giving a brief insight into this. There are tremendous studies and histories and you can read all about this in Gibbon's works and all the other historians. This was a horrific, horrific time of struggle and the worst of all was the final ten years under Diocletian. The last attempt to exterminate the Christian church by the sword. Now, one of the res results of this persecution is that we have no New Testament manuscripts earlier than the 4th century. All were burned. And the killing was halted with the victory of Constantine in 313. See, this, this 10 days of Smyrna, we believe, is one of the greatest arguments for the messages of the seven churches being applied to successive ages. Well, this divine... Time measure, this thing forces the issue. It is highly unlikely that a persecution of ten literal days upon a single church would warrant insertion relative to the vast persecutions which have, you know, historically already unfolded. Or Uriah Smith again noted, quote, again, apply this persecution to any of the notable persecutions of that period. And how could it be spoken of as the fate of one church alone? All the churches suffered in them. And what then would be the propriety of singling out one to the exclusion of the rest as alone involved in such a calamity? Now, we, there are great works, Fox's Book of Martyrs uh, and stuff, where you can read what happened in these ten horrific pagan Roman persecutions, and you will be in tears when you read. And we think we've had a hard time. We have not yet resisted unto blood, many of us. The next phase, Pergamus. Now we date this about the rise of Constantine, 313, to the year 606, which has significance in the grand scheme of things. And the angel of the church in Pergamos, and to the angel, write, These things saith he which has a sharp sword with two edges. Pergamos, and during this presentation you'll be able to see where these seven churches were located in Asia. Pergamos was, was the farthest north of the seven churches. It was once the capital of the kingdom of Pergamos, which was great. It's a, it was a prosperous city at the time when John wrote. The word Pergamos means married to power. Married to power. This period extends from professed conversion of Constantine to the rise and establishment of the papacy. See, in 80, folks, in AD 313, with the decree of coronation, made, this made Rome the center of Christendom. All right? It was a period that manifested, it had, 
a struggle with worldly influences, they were beginning to enter into the church at a very dramatic way, rate, quite frankly. Many were pr professing Christianity just to, to gain political power. Truly, the liberated church was marrying the power of the Roman state. This fueled the mystery of iniquity which resulted in the maturing and development of the papal man of sin. This is setting all this stage after the subdivision of the pagan Roman Empire. Then all this stuff after the end of the pagan persecutions and then the marrying of power and the jockeying for position between the clergy and power. Great, great histories are written on this. The great Dr. Wiley, his writings of these ages and transitions are unmatched. I encourage you to read them and read these centuries. Verse 13, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and you hold fast my name, you've not denied my faith. Even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwells, or dwelleth. Where Satan's seat is, I mean, Christ is recognizing the, how, how difficult of a situation these people are in. And, and we know Satan works in the demonic works wherever Christians reside. However, our scriptures reveal that, uh, and history, that at special times he focuses on specific territories and historical cycles, as you will see revealed further on in the book of Revelation. Who can doubt that he focused or dwelt in the reins of power during the age of pagan Rome? It was Satan who instigated the attempt to exterminate the church during the Smyrna period. Having failed in that attempt, he seeks now to, to corrupt the true doctrines, the true apostolic doctrines. Remember, they were in Ephesus, they were beginning to let, hold of, let, let go hold of effort because they were messed up in their prophetic theology. What Satan would do, he, he needs to raise a counterfeit. And that counterfeit, we know historically and have seen unfold in history, is the Roman Catholic Church. This is the development of the papal beast during the age of Pergamos. At this time in history, the church departs from strict Bible adherence. All sorts of teachings start coming in to the church. Satan, we believe, is centering at Rome and, and laying siege and preparing the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, in which over 50 million people were struck down by the papal sword of bitterness. Paul warned of this transition. See, that's why we examine the falling away, the removal of the hindrance to Antichrist being the Roman pagan government, as foretold in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 7. That's why I spend time there with you. So now when we start addressing these issues, we can see how it's coming into play in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Just to remind you, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed or the son of perdition. We, if you, if you read your history books, uh, history records no greater falling away from the truth than that which was seen in this imperial age of the church. Apostolic doctrine was blatantly disregarded and the tradition, traditions of men replaced the laws of God. The Bible was closed. Rome's Babylonian mysteries became the religion of Europe. Now, We've talked a lot, and we're going to hammer by of necessity not God's people in Catholicism, but her doctrines and her messengers. I want to encourage you not to have contempt for these teachings and these doctrines that we talk about concerning Catholicism. Read these works first, then come back and talk to me about it. First of all, read the Bible, right? Take, take a little 
time and read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons or Papal Worship. Lorraine Botner's Roman Catholicism. William Cathcart's The Papal System. Wiley's, the one who wrote the Hawaii Apocalyptica, his work, The Papacy. Peter DeRosa's Vickers of Christ. Just to name a few witnesses that I have read in our outstanding works. Not only is this uh, doctrinal, doctrinal falling away uh, relevant, but also, see, this is the removal of Antichrist's hindrance. The pagan power is gone. The persecutions have stopped. The church is marrying power. So we're covering the 4th through the 7th centuries. It's during this 5th century eight, that the last Roman emperor in the West was removed. The fifth trumpet, Revelation 8 and 12, is a specific prophecy of this event. And we will examine this later, in this event of the falling away in this time. Paul prophesied again in 2 Thessalonians 2. He said, I told you, remember when I was with you, I told you that there's going to be something that's hindering, there's, it's letting, it's going to be revealed in this time. And only he that lets or hinders until he be taken out of the way. And I'm paraphrasing all that. And you should be able to follow me from now. That's why Paul, this is what's coming to pass. Paul said it was. And we've already studied, I believe, quite well the hindrance in the situation there. We also had great quotes. Early church fathers about all this fear, their desire to pray for the Roman emperors in the empire, some of them crying, oh my gosh, the world is at end, Antichrist must be at hand. We've already looked at those quotes. I'll not read them again. So in, in, in concluding Pergamus here, we see that Paul had good reason for refusing to openly name the hindrance you know, he would have brought swift judgment as already mentioned to Thessalonica. And just a, uh, just, a, a few, uh, just a little bit of thought, because we're dealing with Antipas, the martyr that was slain amongst them. We, 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 uh, really, there's not much ecclesiastical history concerning an individual named Antipas. Uh, however, you know, we have a book of symbols and, and of symbolic language. And uh, one uh, man observed, and uh, old William Miller, I thought it was kind of interesting, but uh, this is what he had to say about it in his lectures. It is supposed that Antipas was not an individual, but a class of men. In that day, being a combination of two words, anti or opposed, and Papa's father, or Pope. <laughs> and at that time, many of them suffered martyrdom in Constantinople and Rome, where the bishops and the popes began to exercise the power, which soon after brought into subjection kings of the earth, and trampled on the rights of the Church of Christ. And for myself, I see no reason to reject this explanation of the word Antipas in this text, as the history of those times is perfectly silent respecting such an individual here named. So are we dealing with another sign? Are we dealing with another symbol? We, we don't know, but uh, it's just kind of interesting. Verse 14, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Jesus is accusing the, the church of, of imitating Baal. Now, the Hebrew noun Baal means master, and it's often going to appear with various 
you know, suffixes, Baal Peor, Baal Berith, in, in various words. The Baal cults challenged the worship of Yahweh throughout Israelite history. It was Baal that Elijah confronted at Mount Carmel. We read that in 1 Kings 18. We can also see Numbers chapters 20 through to 25 and 31. The age, or this age, these, these centuries of the marrying of power, was full of teachers like, and pro, like the prophets of Baal, Balaam who seduced the true Israel into sin. Balaam instructed the Moabite king Balak on how to lead the children of Israel astray while they were attempting to enter the promised land. Balak coaxed them or Israel to eat that which was sacrificed to idols. Many of you are very familiar with the story. They fell into sin and God was forced to punish them. The Pergamos church now was being tempted during this time from 313 to 606 to worship idols, to commit spiritual fornication. History records that this is the rise of the papacy. The carnality of the Roman Empire deceived the church like Balak deceived Israel of old. As we've already noted, Satan couldn't destroy the church with how many? Ten persecutions. Which one was the worst? The last, the tenth, the ten years under Diocletian. So, now he compromises with it. Christians were tempted into joining idol feasts and heathen fornication. Check this out. This is what was going down by the end of the fifth century. The following unscriptural doctrines and practices had become deeply rooted in the church. Prayers for the dead. A belief in purgatory, which if you don't know, it's a place in which souls are purified after death before they can enter into heaven. In other words, you get to die and go suffer just like if you were in the literal explanation of hell until you've uh, cooked enough to be worthy. <clears throat> the 40-day Lenten season. The view that the Lord's Supper is a sacrifice and that its administrators are priests. A sharp division of the members of the church into clergy, officers of the church, and laity, ordinary church members. We had the veneration or the adoration of martyrs and of saints, and above all, the adoration of Mary. The burning of tapers or candles in their honor. Veneration of relics of martyrs and saints, the ascription of magical powers to these relics. We had pictures, images, altars, and the church's gorgeous vestments for the clergy, more and more elaborate and splendid ritual, less and less preaching. We had pilgrimages to holy places starting, monasticism, worldliness, persecutions of the heathens, and the heretics. The church is marrying power. The hindrance is out of the way. The bishops of Rome are rising. 15, verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. We've already talked about very briefly, and I, I, I realize I didn't do it justice, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. There are things that Christ hates, and he's, he's determined to fight against. He fights with the sword of his mouth, which is the Word of God. These fights and judgments are launched by his ministers. Remember Luther? And I believe now we're entering into another fight. Verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone. And in that stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receives it. See, the overcomers receive a white stone, which is a reflection of glory of the New Jerusalem uh, you know, which will someday reflect the Lord's glory to all the world. Now what's neat, again, here, here's where understanding history and ancient courts, 
courts excuse me, of justice. The acquittal of a criminal was declared by the majority of white stones being cast into the judicial urn. The jurors, the judges, or whatever would have black stones and white stones. And then upon the, commence, the ending of the trial or the processions or whatever, or the evidence, they would either cast the black stone for guilt or the white stone for acquittal. Christ will pronounce the acquittal of all those who have overcome on Judgment Day.